and we want to get to Chris Daniels. Chris, how are you doing today? I'm doing fine, thanks. Chris, um, you know, you, you're like a, kind of interesting. You're probably about the most publicized wrestler who has, has not been given any kind of a significant push in WWF or WCW. Um, pretty well acknowledged as one of the best, maybe some would say the best independent wrestler. You've actually, you're not a secret in that, like, everyone in wrestling knows about you. You've had your tryouts in both companies. You had a contract with WCW. You've worked in Japan extensively in the last couple of years. Just got back from England a couple of weeks back. Um, what, you know, what, what, what's your future in wrestling right now? I mean, do you have any deal with WWF or, or how does that stand right now? Um, right now it's, it's still kind of up in the air. There's no solid deal with WWF, but, uh, we're in the middle of like talking about it. So nothing, nothing concrete to say. You know, hopefully, um, hopefully in the next couple of weeks, something, uh, something will, uh, come about, but right now it's kind of up in the air. What's what's been your feelings as far as like in wrestling over say the last let's say a year to eighteen months? Kind of like your name's out there. You're sort of a secret. You're sort of not a secret. You've you've been around. You know on TV. You had the chance in WCW. How would you like? Are you frustrated? Or are you happy just because you know you got to be a star in Japan during that period? Or what's your thoughts as far as like the last eighteen months of your career? Um, well, I wasn't I wasn't happy. I mean, I was happy to go to Japan, but it wasn't like I was satisfied. Like that was as far as I wanted to go. I've always wanted to have the job in the States, uh, whether it was with WWF or WCW. I was just looking for the opportunity to work for a company that was going to give me the opportunity to do what I could do. And so um, when I got signed in March, I was I was ecstatic. I mean, you know, a lot of people said, why didn't you go to the WWF? Why didn't you uh, hold out for the WWF? And the truth of the matter was WCW is still one of the top, you know, three companies in the business. And regardless of how far down they were in the ratings or how much of a, a mismatch people perceived WCW versus WWF, it was still an opportunity to go to a company where, you know, hopefully they would give you an opportunity to, to get on television and become part of something that hopefully was going to have a chance to move up to, to become more of a, a match as far as the ratings and as far as the, the head-to-head competition. And uh, it just never materialized, uh, unfortunately. So it, it was kind of a... I was happy to be signed, but when it when it when it was all said and done, I was a little disappointed, and uh, I feel like I would rather have been wrestling somewhere rather than just have been signed and, and sit at home like I did. Who first brought you into WCW? Um, I actually was signed. Uh, the person that offered me the job was Kevin Sullivan. So, and then he so, was so gone. You were, right. So you were you were you you came in like right, and then he was gone, and then you were kind of in limbo at that point. Yeah, what, went? what happened was um, I went back. My last tour of Japan was uh, like the first week of March, like the first three weeks of March. And so I signed my contract uh, like the first day of March, and that was when it was set from March 1st. And um, with the understanding that when I got back, Kevin said that I would be on television kind of right away. And so while I was in Japan, the whole turnaround happened where Vince Russo and Eric Bischoff came back and when I came back, they had kind of put me on hold because Vince and Eric really had no idea who I was. So um, for a while, I thought that because Kevin had left, I was going to be let go. And they told me, don't worry about it. Your contract is with WCW. It's not with Kevin Sullivan. So after a while, uh, I just waited at home. And then around June, they called me, and they brought me on the road with them for a couple weeks. And uh, that was when they tried to do the thing with Vampiro. And that never worked out. So then they took me off the talent list, and then a couple of weeks later they called me and released me. The thing with Vampiro, you were you were the you were the guy in that cloak, right? Right. And where, where was do you know where that was supposed to go, or did because you were like I think you did, but what one or two TVs, and then it, the the character was just I guess dropped or something. Yeah, we did. We actually did the one uh, the one vignette with me under the hood where I had the speaking role. And uh, the idea was going to be that I was I was going to play pretty much the fallen angel character minus the like the visual religious overtones. They wanted me to play a more of a cult leader, um, kind of like a David Koresh character. And the idea was going to be that I was going to have some sort of hold over Vampiro, whether it was uh, like a mental thing or or some sort of information that I had that he didn't want out. It was some sort of uh, power that I had over Vampiro that he was going to come to me and uh, I was going to guide him, sort of. And then at some point we'd break away and then I would be on my own uh, to 
you know, interact with different different uh, wrestlers in the Federation. And um, the idea was the first day it was supposed to be they were going to shoot from behind me. It wasn't going to be me under a cloak. It was just going to be me. They were going to shoot from behind me, so they didn't see my face. But uh, for some reason, the director nixed that, and they did that side shot where I was under the cloak. And uh, we did it the, the one Monday after the pay-per-view, and then the Tuesday they didn't do anything, and then by the next week they had already killed it. Were you, I mean, like, you know, sitting at home during most of that 90-day period and then watching TV and seeing, I mean, did, did you have this thing where it was just sort of like, well, I've got to wait my turn, or did you have the attitude of, look at what they're putting on TV, I know I can, like, you know, work rings around at least some of these guys, you know what I mean, you know, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, or, I, I, um, when I heard that I was going to be kind of put on the back burner, I kind of understood because I knew that they were going to try and rebuild from where, what, with what they had first. They didn't want to put any new characters on because I guess the whole idea was they were going to start from scratch when, when Vince and Eric came back. So I, I kind of understood that I wasn't going to be, you know, the top, uh, you know, the main priority at that point. So I was, I was content to sit and wait for a while. But, um, you know, after, after a little bit, I got the impression that, you know, Eric and Vince were always talking about they were going to try and build new talent. They are going to try and get new faces. They were going to try and make stars instead of depend on the stars that they had had. And, um, you know, I, I, I thought that I fit that bill rather well. And as time went on and, and they didn't use me, I got a little discouraged. But, uh, you know, those are the breaks. So Now, now right after um, they dropped you from contract, I think it was like three or four days later, they were doing TV in, I think it was, was it Long Beach, but it was Southern California, and then you were, you, they used you again. Right. Yeah, go figure. I worked more. I worked more for them as someone out of contract than I did when I was under contract. So that's. And then, it. and then, like in recent weeks, um, you did the WWF thing with the, the Conquistadors. Uh, now, which matches were you and Aaron Aguilera, and which matches were Edge and Christian? Um, it was always Edge and Christian. They we never wrestled as as the Conquistadors. Oh really? Um, you, never. You yeah. Oh, I thought that one of the matches. So so the it was like the first the, one. The only time that we were in front of the people as the Conquistadors was when uh, Edge and Christian were wrestling too cool, and the Conquistadors came out and like went to the ringside and made faces and went, ah, and uh, that was us. But every other time it was Edge and Christian, and and it made sense because the idea, as far as I understood it, was they wanted people to, they wanted everybody to know it was Edge and Christian all along, and so for us to go out and wrestle. Uh, I think it would have given away that it was two different people, and then they would have had to address who the two different people were, and they didn't want to do that. So, wow! No, no, no. This is, we actually have to head to a break. No, I was just going to make a comment that uh, you got a lot of favorable um, publicity for one of the matches that it was actually Christian. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I, I did read that. I actually read that somewhere that. Someone said that Christian looked better than he had before. Good job, Chris Daniels. And I was like, thanks. I think a lot of people said that, including me. Was it? I wrote I wrote that, yeah. I thought that um, and Edge didn't, <laughs> which yeah. I was blame on Aaron Aguilera. Oh, well. Yeah. So much for that. I'm glad you cleared that up. Chris, you know, a lot of people, I think, are probably under the impression, since your name has kind of gotten out in the last two or so years, that you've been wrestling maybe about two years. But you've actually been around wrestling. I mean, how long? It's been It's been quite a while, actually. It'll be eight years in January. And were you, did you grow up in Chicago or start in Chicago? I, I started in Chicago. I actually grew up in North Carolina, but I um, I started training in Chicago in '93. Uh, with uh, with Windy City. Right, right. Um, now, go ahead. Are you are you what, what's the are, were you friends with Kevin Quinn? What's the are you related? I mean, I've heard all kinds of stories about Kevin and I. Uh, we train together. We're not related, but uh, we're basically best friends in the business. And uh, he and I started, he started training about five or six months before I did. And uh, we just kind of came up together, and uh, we tagged together for a long time. And, you know, even when I moved out to California and he was still in Chicago, we, we stayed in touch and we kept real close. So, uh, but we're not related by blood or anything. Now, when was, was, was your first Michinoku tour or your first Japanese tour, was that as Curry Man or did you ever go to Japan before that? I went one time for Mishinoku as myself, as the Fallen Angel, in uh, April right. of 99. And that was the last tour before the Mass Man tournament. And that was when they decided to bring me back to do the Curry Man gimmick. 
So it was their idea for Curry Man or something you came up with? No, it was completely their idea. I had no idea what it was, even when they handed it to me. I kind of looked at that, it like, what that the was, hell? Visually, that was one of the stranger gimmicks. Yeah, exactly. And uh, <laughs> they had to explain it to me a couple times. I I didn't know exactly. Like, the first, when I got there, they said, you are Karema. And I went, what's Karema? What's Karema? And so they, they handed me a T-shirt with the list of names in it. I read it and said, Curry Man. I was like, okay, what's that? So then the game, they handed me the gimmick, and it was one of those, oh, no, <laughs> be a long, long, long tour. But uh, it, I, I had no idea that it was going to turn out the way it did. You know, when, How did you first uh, get to Japan? What's that? What was your first tour in Japan, and how did you get in there? Um, my first tour was that tour in Mishinoku in April of 99. That was the first time I'd ever gone. And it had a lot to do with uh, Taka Mishinoku and uh, Victor Quinones. Um, they had had a tour previously where someone had dropped out at the last minute and they tried to get me on it, but uh, because they had like five days' notice to try and get someone new, and uh, they couldn't get the visa information to me in, in time to get it through the embassy, so they just told me that I would come at a later date, and that was April. So I went out, and it was like a week, a week and a half tour that I went. And um, at the end of that tour, they said I was going to come back, but they were going to make a mask for me because the next tour was going to be the Mask Man tournament and everybody that was on that tour was going to be under the hood and uh, that was at that point they decided that I was going to be the one that was going to do this Curry Man gimmick for them and you were in um, you were in the uh, what's it called Super J Cup right um, how was uh, well actually you only had one match right yeah I had to go out in the first round yeah they, was um, that because was that because you had to um, come back to, for WCW or was, it just, or was it just their booking um, I think, well, I think they knew that I had to come back for WCW. Um, I think if I could have stayed and come back for the next week or stayed for that next week, I think I probably would have only made it to the semis anyway or one more match. But, um, yeah, I think it, it, they knew that I had to go back on the second because I was supposed to be in Colorado on the ninth. That was, or whatever the day was. Uh, when they did the whole big switch for WCW, that was going to be my first day at TV. And so I told them I had to come back like a week early and get ready. So uh, I only I only did the first round against that guy from uh, Wrestle Dream Factory. Is that on, on Rio? Right. Right, right. That was an interesting, that's an interesting gimmick. He's kind of like a, a high-flying Undertaker thing. Yeah, yeah, I was, uh, I, I liked the gimmick when I first saw it. And, uh, over the course of the weeks that I was out there and I saw pictures and, and uh, a couple of video promos on him, I was uh, I, I kind of liked it. I thought it was pretty neat. And it was a different little thing that they had going on out there because a lot of the guys, they're either under a hood or they're by themselves. There are a whole lot of guys that are doing like a, a gimmick where they're, you know, makeup and, and a, you know, that type of, uh, that type of gimmick. So I, I thought it was pretty cool. Do you have a problem communicating in the ring in Japan? Um, no, most of the wrestlers that I met speak enough English that we could, uh, you know, kind of put together what we needed to put together. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, we, but, you know, we would talk it out a lot. We would talk it out pretty much front to back. We wouldn't, it wouldn't be like, okay, I'll do this, and then I'll just work you, work you, work you until this point. We pretty much went pretty much top to bottom. And then, uh, you know, if I had to call something that I didn't tell them beforehand, it would, I would keep it simple. But um, there was a, there was a couple times where it was a little difficult, and uh, we'd have to get a translator in the in the locker room to go like, okay, this is what I want to do, this is what he wants to do, and uh, we'd smooth it out. But most of, nine times out of ten, we re- really didn't have a problem. How was uh, how was England? England was fun. The, the the two times I went over there, I really had a lot of a lot of fun with those guys. Um, the first time I went out was for a guy named Dan Berlinka, and he was trying to start a company called the UWA. So I went out for a TV taping for them, and uh, I had a real good time out there. But they, it was like they made the whole like international thing was all about me coming out. So I was kind of like the the invading American of the whole crew, and everybody else was like homegrown talent. And then um, just recently, I went back out for this group called the U, uh, UCW that was headed by one of the guys that was. Uh, what do you call it? Uh, um, I guess he was a color commentator for them. I don't know if, or a talent scout or something. But now he's like the head guy. And this time he tried to bring a lot of different people in. He brought in Otani 
and he brought me in, and he tried to make it like an international thing. And um, I just went out for the one show this last time in October, and uh, hopefully I'll be going back out there. But I had a lot of I had a lot of fun. It was just I expected a lot more mat wrestling out of the, the British guys that I met, and there was a lot of guys that could fly and 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 do a lot more stuff than I expected. Now, now you wrestled Otani on that show, right? Right. Yeah. What would what, what was your thoughts about that? Because you you did never work with him before, had you? No, no, I never had. I uh, I was a little intimidated, to be honest with you. I you know. Uh, to know that you're going to go in and wrestle a guy l- like Otani, a guy of his, uh, you know, his reputation, and and know that he's going to put you over. I, I was a little intimidated, and I, I you know, I, I went in kind of nervous. But uh, he was a real, he was a real nice guy, real generous, and uh, I thought we, we put together a pretty good match. Do you did you talk to him about like what what he's up to or anything? Because it's kind of funny that you know a guy. You know, he's kind of an, I don't know if exile is the right word, but it's a, a guy of that talent, and he's kind of wrestling in England where no, one's, when no one hears about it. You know what? I didn't get a chance to speak to him uh, because he kind of kept to himself, and he didn't really speak a lot of English anyway. But I, I did speak to the promoter, and he kind of clued me in because I thought they brought him in just for that match. And, uh, and then in discussion with the promoter, he told me that he was kind of staying over there and uh, that he was kind of on the outs with New Japan and... He didn't know if it was a gimmick or if it was a shoot, and uh, I never really got like a clear idea of what was going on. But um, a, a, the promoter didn't know, or Otani didn't know. Uh, the promoter didn't. Ota- know. I don't know. Yeah. If, I don't know if Otani knows what's going on or not. Like I said, I, I didn't really speak to him. <laughs> but the promoter was kind of. He was kind of fifty-fifty. He thought it might be a work, and he might be a shoot. That, that he, he might was be upset a- with New Japan. Yeah, I mean, it's probably. Japanese thing is, I mean, it's, there's probably something to it to get them out of there, but they also they also like to get guys out of there every now and then so they can bring them back and kind of give them a new look and yeah, kind of I had heard them. that I had heard that they were thinking about bringing him back, kind of revamping a character for him, or not a character in the sense of you know character in America, but just to uh, give him like a new attitude or a new look or something like that. So yeah, I guess uh, time will tell on that. What guys have you always wanted to work with that you haven't had a chance to? Um, I was looking. I was really looking forward to working with Billy Kidman when I was in WCW. That was one of my major. Uh, I've I've been under the impression, or my opinion is that Billy is one of the best guys that WCW has uh, all around. And I was really looking forward to working with him. And I was kind of upset that that didn't get to go. Um, uh, there's a lot. There's really a lot of guys, uh, you know, because all the stuff that I've ever done for WWF, uh, they kind of kept me with the, the light heavyweight guys. So, you know, I was always wanting to work with guys like D'Lo Brown and Edge and Christian and, uh, um, you know, guys like that. And, uh, you know, hopefully later on down the line I'll have that opportunity. Uh, yeah. I, I still really haven't had a chance to work with Reckless Youth a lot. I, I did like a, an eight-man tag and we worked at like a, a total of like three minutes. And then we did a one a triple threat match, but we never really did a singles match between each other. Was that like a Super 8? What's that? Was that like the Super 8? No, we did some stuff for um, Pennsylvania Championship. There was a, uh, a three-way for their heavyweight title that we did with uh, Two Cold Scorpio. And that's like the extent of my working with Reckless Youth. But um, it was supposed to be something, the not in, in 1999 it was supposed to be Reckless and me in the finals of the Super 8, and he uh, he pulled out because he was hurt, and they replaced him with Steve Bradley, and that was uh, that was like the big gimmick at the time because Steve Bradley wasn't even supposed to be in the tournament, and he ended up winning it. So uh, yeah, I I still haven't had a chance to work the singles match with Reckless yet. Of, of guys, and you know, you work you probably worked as much as far as certainly for a West Coast guy, but um, almost for anyone as far as like. A lot of different independents because you've been really all all over the country. I mean, are there any ones that that are like your favorite, and any guys that you have worked with or that you've seen on these shows that are kind of like undiscovered talents? Um, I don't I don't have like a favorite. I have a lot of I have a lot of favorites. Um, I really enjoy working for Jim Kettner and the ECWA out in Delaware. Um, every time he's brought me out, whether it was the Super Eight or or any of his regular shows, I've uh, I've really had a, a good time. He's got a good crew. Uh, a good crew, and uh, just uh, his fans are there. You know, he's he's conditioned his fans to appreciate the guys that he has there, 
and uh, every time I've gone, they've, they've had a live crowd. Um, I, I enjoy working for Roland Alexander and APW. I think they've got a, a good bunch of guys, and, um, you know, guys like Mike Modest and Donovan Morgan and Tony Jones, those guys, uh, you know, they're, they're kind of on the bubble uh, of being finally brought into the big, you know, the big three. Um, I liked working for PCW. There's a guy that just started out in uh, Chicago named Brian Zenner, who's doing uh, Midwest Championship Wrestling. And right now he's using guys like uh, Vic Capri and Jason Rain. And I think those two guys are definitely going to be names that are going to be all over the place in the next couple of years. Are you still doing the 1-800 Collect shows? No, you know what? I, I stopped doing that. I just did it the one year. I, I don't know if they're still even doing... Uh, that same type of tour or not? If they Actually, are, yeah, I, they are. They are. They're coming up here in uh, December. Oh, really? Mm-hmm. Curses! I I lost out on that one. I guess. Mm. <laughs> let's let's. Uh, should we head to a break or should we start going to the to the phones? What's the phones? Okay, let's go to Matt in San Francisco. Matt, what's going on? Hey, Chris. Hey, Dave and Chico. Hey. Hey. Hello. How's how's it going, guys? Fine. How are you? Ah, been better. Been better. Uh, tell me, Chris, how's it been? Wor- how's it been uh, working in UPW? Uh, it's been a lot of fun. I, it's it's been good to be part of something that's been growing as fast as it has. Um, when I first started working for UPW, you could tell that uh, it was a new a new bunch of guys and a new promotion. And in the last year, year and a half, you can really see the improvement in not just the wrestlers themselves, but in the whole. Uh, the whole promotion as far as, uh, you know, their production, their preparation, uh, the things they want to do in the future. It's just been a lot of fun to be a part of that. And uh, I think a lot of guys, especially now that they've got uh, their ties to the WWF, I think a lot of their guys are going to be coming up from there and, and making their name for themselves outside of UPW. So uh, I, I've been real happy to work for them. Yeah. If you, you know, I know you aspire to... Uh get to New York, WWF, you are in the right place. Okay, uh, here. I, I know think so. talked about it a couple weeks ago, where they're at the bottom, and it goes up to, you know, it, any of the minor league, Ohio Valley or whatever, and then the dark matches, and then on to TV. I noticed that you, you skipped, you know, you skipped a couple, and you were working some darks. Uh, didn't you and a hardcore kid work out in Chicago? Actually, we did a um, we did a dark match in Ohio, um, and while I was doing the Conquistador thing, I did a couple dark matches with uh, K Crush or K Quick. Uh, so I I did I've done some dark matches on and off. I actually started out doing dark matches, and then I started working for UPW. So I'm I started kind of close to the top, and I'm kind of working my way around in a circle. <laughs> it's an odd it's an odd career path <laughs> with a with a short stay in WCW to top it off. So. Well, my personal opinion is, is Mike Modest is the, the top technical rest, independent wrestler in the country. I know you've worked with him a couple times. Mm-hmm. Uh, what, what do you think of working with him in the ring? Um, I've had good matches with Mike. I've been real real happy, I think, because we've only really had the opportunity to work together twice. And both of the matches that we had, uh, I was real. I was very happy with, especially the second one. And I, I think Mike is, is one of those guys that he's on the bubble of being brought in. It's just a matter of, of time and, and luck. And uh, I, I, I can't say – I can say nothing but good about Mike. Yeah, I, I see Mike as, as a talent that, that a promotion can build around um, just because of, you know, he, he can work, you know, in the ring. He could do this stuff on TV and whatnot. And also, you know, he's a damn good trainer. And he's uh, also he's also an underrated promo. He's a damn good heel. Yeah, Dave, I mean, like, you know, you've been a in lot, the wars. Come on. You know, I know he's he's. A, I think he's a he's a great performer. You know, the thing with a lot of the guys on the independent level that some people don't recognize. I mean, I think there's this this mentality with some of them that like even the ones that are good workers, so to speak. It's like, well, they're good workers, but what are we going to do with them? Because our business revolves around promos, not realizing that there are some guys. At that level, who who are good promos? I don't think that they, that they get the credit for that because, you know, the people don't like with, with Modest, for example, when he went to WCW, he never really had a chance to do a promo. I don't think Chris 
was ever given a chance to, to show what he could do on a promo. So they're thinking like, well, you know, it's a, it's he's a good worker, but you know, this whole business is promos, and it kind of hurts some guys who actually, you know, it, it's another thing where you talk about not getting a chance. Uh, it's just another aspect of it. Yeah, and there's there's really no place, there's really no forum for independent guys to show that they can do promos. I mean, you know, you can grab a microphone at the beginning of a match, but that's not really the type of thing that they're doing now. And so it's it's kind of it's kind of an unfair it's kind of an unfair deal where you never really get a chance to either work on or or prove that you can do the types of promos that are being done on television. And and you know, I Dave, I think you're exactly right. Mike is completely a good promo, but not many people would know it because how many people would have actually seen it? Yeah. What was it like to uh, to work with Kurt Angle? Because I know you had the chance to work with him not all that long ago. Um, it was it was uh, it was uh, it was great. I had a good time working with Kurt. Um, Kurt and I met like two years ago when he was in the dojo. We were both in the dojo together at, at the WWF, and uh, to see where he's come or how far he's come in two years, it was uh, it was kind of cool and. It's weird because as much success as he's had in the last year, he's he's probably a nicer guy now than he was when I first met him. And so, um, you know, there was that that the fact that we had met before and had uh, spent time together at the dojo. There was that comfort factor because we knew each other, and uh, you know, I, I knew that he was you know coming off a concussion, and uh, there were just all these little factors that uh, we had to kind of tailor the match around the fact that he couldn't take any big bumps. And we still put together a match that, you know, I think a lot of people thought was something that could be termed match of the year. And so I was wow. real happy to, to have that opportunity. And I think too, it was it was the first time that WWF, the people from WWF, had seen me wrestle in like a year. And so I was glad to put that effort in front of them and you know kind of refresh their memory as to what I could do. And so it was it was a real good situation for me, and it, it kind of got me back on track because it seemed like for six months while I was on the the WCW vacation plan. Uh, I kind of dropped out of sight, and then all of a sudden, I kind of hopped back into into the spotlight by wrestling Kurt. So, any other That's overseas nice. tours besides England and Japan? Um, I did some stuff in Puerto Rico for um, the IWA. I was on their uh, inaugural TV tapings, and uh, I might be going back there in the future. I don't know. It's up in the air. Now, that first, that, that first was that the pilot stuff, or was that when they started the company up? Uh, you know, when they started actually the company up. Uh, that, that was the that, pilot stuff. Okay, the because they, they, they brought in all kinds of good good talent from all over the world for that one, didn't they? Yeah, like, they I remember did. seeing the magazine, like Sasuke and all those guys, right? They, yeah, they actually had the first night they had a, a, a lightweight or a, a cruiserweight Royal Rumble Battle Royal. And, like, the list of guys, and it was, like, Sasuke, Tiger Mask, Taka, um, you know, Super Crazy, Tajiri, Alexander Otsuka, uh Reckless Youth, Jeff Hardy, you know, me, the the list, it was just like a, a who's who. And, uh, you know, and that was just the cruiserweight. That was just for the tournament that they had. You know, they had other guys outside of that tournament that they, you know, the Headhunters and, and uh, Aguila and all these guys. So it was, a, it was pretty stacked. It was a pretty stacked three-day deal. Let's go real quick to Matt. Matt, what's going Matt, we just want to finish up. Yep. Uh, okay. I know, I know you remember the match in... Uh, September of 98 at the Raw the raw taping game in San Jose, where uh, Chris and Taka tore down the house. Um, I actually didn't see that match. No, you didn't You didn't see the shotgun night? Um, no, because I was, because on Monday nights, I, even even when Raw comes to San Jose, I won't, I can't go Monday because i got to watch Nitro. i got to watch both shows. Mm -hmm. So, um, I've been to a lot of SmackDown tapings. I don't, I haven't, I don't know that I've ever been to a Raw taping because of that whole deal on Monday. I may have never been to one. Um, I could be wrong. I mean, maybe like before '95, I, I went to one. I mean, I went to, I mean, I went to these endless WWF TV tapings in the like '80s and '90s. You know, those four-hour marathons. Yeah. I mean, like, but compared to by, by today's standards, I mean, I mean, those things. I mean, they were so bad if you compare them with the stuff that's going on today. That's all I can say. It's like night and day. It was a great match. Uh, hey, Dave, uh, I'll email you my my address, or you can email me, and I'll get you out of the tape. But it's oh, okay. a great, great match. I mean, totally tore down the house. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. That was probably the best WWF TV match that I've seen in probably...
probably the last five years. Well, then I really want to see it. <laughs> it was great. I mean, Chris Chris hit his finish, you know, and he showboated, you know, and of course Taka kicked out, but it was still, and the and the, the finish was totally out of nowhere. You know, it was just a great match, and Mikey Henderson had a great match, too, with uh, Funaki that night. That was a hell of a, hell of a caving, plus being in the front row, you know, it was pretty cool, too. <laughs> you may remember that... Uh, Modest and Donovan worked the opener. Yeah, yeah, I remember that day. That was a that was a good set. It was actually when um, it was right around the time that Blasting was doing his uh, Beyond the Mat taping, and he wasn't there, but he was there the next night, and uh, that was the night that Modest and Tony Jones had their tryout. So and they tore down the house. Yeah, yeah, that's so. I don't know. You know, it's 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 it's, it's well, you know, Chris, what's it like to do a tryout match because. It's like one of those things where the fans are so conditioned to see stars that, you know, you're working with such a handicap almost. Um, you know, you know what I mean? Like they're they're conditioned not to think you're good because they've never seen you on TV, and you really got to win them over. Yeah, I think um, I think the uh, the bar is set really high for tryout matches because there's no there's no downtime. I mean, a lot of the things that go on on television, there's there's a, there's a comfort zone because people know that. Uh, I mean, the guys that go out that are on television all the time, they know that all they really have to do is poke their head out the curtain, and the crowd is, is with them or against them, depending on who they are. But uh, if you're unknown, the people are brutal the minute you come out. And it's really bad when you have to try and play the babyface role because you come out there and you're trying to get the crowd behind you, and they're like, Jobber! <laughs> you know, and you're like, oh, it's going to be a long match. But uh, I, I was uh, I was pretty lucky because I think it's really hard when two guys, com- like two complete uh, unknown guys go out there, and and it's like, no matter what you do, unless you're hitting you know huge, uh, you know stardust presses and and all these big big moves, the crowd is, is you you already got two strikes against you, and so I was really lucky that all this most of the stuff that I ever did uh, was with again was against guys that people knew, so at least they had that to kind of get behind of the stuff I had against Taka and the stuff I had against Kaintai. At least they had that recognition factor. And so it wasn't like a complete, you know, boo, get out of there, get out of the ring. We want to see, you know, whoever whoever the star is. And, um, you know, uh, at least at least I didn't have that going against me all the time. But uh, yeah, it's difficult. And, um, you know, I, I was just happy. I was just happy that we had good matches. You know, Taka uh, was one of the guys that was real generous, and and he he really put me over like a million dollars in that match that that guy is talking about. Uh, we really, really was, it was almost like 80% me. And uh, I had, a, you know, just to have that kind of thing where Taka would put you over in front of that many people and, and to the people in the back, uh, it was it was a big deal, and I really appreciate it. Okay, we're going to move to Sean in Florida. Sean, what's going on? Uh, hey, guys. Uh, I wanted to ask uh, if you'd heard anything about uh, the uh, Bubble the Love Sponge show this morning. I have not. Brian, have you heard anything? No, nothing. Uh, okay. He was, uh, he had Hogan on, as uh, pretty oh, much oh, usual. Boy. Oh, was Jimmy Hart on there? <laughs> no, but uh, he was <laughs> pumping up. I guess he's going to have a dark match with uh, Texas Hangman on uh, Survivor Series, Bubba is. And, uh, yeah, well, so he, he works, whenever anyone comes to Tampa, I think it's like it's like um, the mob. You have to put Bubba on the card. <laughs> precisely, exactly. And uh, anyway, him and uh, Hogan were kind of teasing that, Hogan was gonna, you know, come over the railing and and help him out in that match, and it was just kind of <laughs> odd that they would even tease that, with, and it wouldn't seem there would be any possibility of that happening. Well, no, well let's see, he can't appear on TV, but if it's in a dark match, I wonder what the legalities are of that. I mean, I'm pretty sure he can't because he's under contract with WCW until mid March. Right. Which yeah, Bubba was like, uh, "Well, I don't want to get you in trouble with your WCW contract, but." You know, is there a chance? And Hogan was like, "Hey, you never know." Yeah, you know, you know, when, whenever there's a show in Tampa, like any kind of a show, um, like an indie show, there's always those rumors. You know, Hogan's going to come. And, you know, I think he floats them himself, and then you know, but then he doesn't come. <laughs> How about him sitting in the front row? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know what it is because remember when uh, Rena Mero did that? I mean, there was like a lot of problems out of that one. Yeah. If but nothing really person, happened. It was more threatened. Uh, yeah, I'm trying to remember. I, don't, I I mean I don't know like exactly what how the contracts state, but I don't think you can do it because 
you know, when Flair was in the middle of his contract problems with WCW, you know, they wanted to, you know, kind of have, you know, just he'd be like in the crowd at a Greensboro show, and oh, there's Ric Flair just to do it, mm -hmm. and they couldn't do it. Hmm. Uh, so what did what did, did Hogan say anything else like uh, like anything about Russo or Eric? Uh, no, I don't know. I mean, it's, it's almost difficult to get Hogan to talk about wrestling uh, on that show, but anyway, and uh, Bubba went on to. He was pushing tickets pretty hard, so I mean they must be uh, a little They're ways from the out. They're not sold out. Oh boy. Uh, I mean, I mean, it's like I, I shouldn't push the panic button, but I mean, there was a day when you know WF pay per view tickets. They certainly wouldn't be had. They wouldn't certainly be any, any of them left a couple of days before the show. Right. Or Bubba doesn't know what he's talking about. <laughs> well, that's all <laughs> he did go into a, a long spiel about how he had personally had a conversation with Vince McMahon and. Vince had told him that he needed to get people in there at six o'clock, even though the ticket said seven forty-five, and all this. And it's like, okay. Yeah. But, uh, I don't know what to say. I can imagine that conversation. <laughs> I don't know. I just hear about Bubba the Love Sponge, and I've um, I actually never seen him. I've just heard descriptions of him <laughs> what, from his wrestling matches. Yeah. Well, he, a couple of years ago, he was. Enormous. I mean, like 400 pounds enormous. So that he's trimmed down lately. So I'm sure we'll get a high flying spectacle on Sunday. <laughs> that reminds me of some, an email I just got, but <laughs> I got. I'm gonna have to read it in just a second. Any, anything else? No, that's all I got for today. Okay, thanks a bunch, Sean. Um, I wanted to I'll read this really. Read a couple things really quick, and then we'll get back with uh, with Chris. This is um. This, I sort of brought it up. This is from the WWF's new video, no, the No Mercy video game that just came out. It says the game, this is from uh, J.M. Jim, Jim Smith, who says the game is awesome, but there's a few interesting moves. A lot of the females in the WWF only have a few moves in real life. Normally, they only have a few moves in the video games as well, but in No Mercy, they've got a lot of moves, and there's two really good ones. Mae Young's got a Hurricane Rana that she uses all the time, and my personal favorite is Stephanie McMahon's finisher, the Tiger Suplex 85 which I guess is that the half Nelson German suplex, and he goes, yes, Stephanie looks like she does it just like Mitsuharu Misawa. <laughs> I wonder if she designed that game herself. I was say, maybe she wrote that. <laughs> <laughs> um, this is also, um, Vampiro did a real audio interview, and here are some quotes from the interview. Um, so, uh, uh, Vampiro is, by the way, Vampiro is certainly talking like he's never coming back to WCW, which we've been hearing actually for about a week now. Because, sorry, I was just in the bathroom taking a WCW, which I'm sure is going to make people feel really good. They didn't have any toilet paper, but I still wiped my Terry Taylor with a Vince Russo. What do think of that? I wiped my Terry Taylor. Okay, so Vince Russo's toilet paper. Uh, he floated for a bit, then it sunk, just like the ratings for that show, since I'm not there anymore. I really can't say much about the details, because it's a legal thing right now, but I'm definitely out of wrestling, and I'm playing bass for ICP on their Bizarre Bizarre Tour. This isn't a novelty. This isn't a gimmick. I was a musician before I was a wrestler. This isn't what that Chris, uh, he's talking about Chris Jericho, but he says a naughty word, is doing that Fozzy thing. This is for real. I'm done with wrestling. It's not going to happen again unless it's for Juggalo Championship Wrestling. I'm completely gone for wrestling. This is not a gimmick. Wrestling is over. Uh, don't believe it. <laughs> I don't know. I am skeptical. And this is from uh, Mike. This is an interesting one. Um, let's see. Since WrestleMania, name one good storyline the Dudleys have been in. I can't think of one. It's just me, but they just fight meaningless matches every week on Raw and SmackDown. Yeah, they just tease table spots, and Jeevan does the headbutt to the groin. Second, while you've been on the air, Al Gore made a public announcement and cut a promo on George Bush and said, I will meet you in Texas, Florida, or anywhere you want. Who wrote the speech? Ed Ferrara? The promo, I mean speech by Gore, is only second to Jim Byrne. Brian's favorite person, actually my favorite person, at Texas University a few months ago where his speech about the WF turned into a heel promo on the PTC, WCW, and all the ex-sponsors of the WWF. So he cut on the PTC and turned himself heel. Wow, that's pretty difficult to do. So Vern, Vern has a lot of talent in ways we didn't realize. By the way, I also want to make mention because we've gotten several corrections. There are cable packages in Canada that do carry UPN. So... Um, not everyone in Canada was able to get SmackDown. Most were not, but but there were, in fact, people who could. So I just want to bring that up. Um, and let's get back to um, get back to Chris. Chris, I wanted to ask you, you know, we brought up Kurt Angle a couple of minutes ago. 
um, you were at the um, you were at the dojo with him when he like literally the first time he ever probably saw pro wrestling because he was not a fan growing up or anything. Um, not first, not the first time he ever saw it, but the first time he was ever really around it. I mean, did you think that he had the potential to be where he's gotten in two years, or does that floor you? Um, I was a little bit surprised. I mean, I, I knew that he had the talent, but he was such a quiet guy that I didn't I didn't see the guy like the sense of humor that that he exhibits on television. I didn't see that there. He was just kind of quiet. He kind of stayed to himself, and so it, I was expecting almost like uh, like the '80s style amateur wrestler turns into professional wrestler type wrestler and uh and so when i finally saw what he was doing on television it was a big surprise and then to see how far he's been pushed and 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 how how he's gotten over is 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 a real uh, a pleasant surprise but a surprise nonetheless got a couple emails from england uh, asking a lot of a lot of them asking about your um experiences there uh what uh, you think of the state of british wrestling and uh, what do you think are the standout workers in British wrestling as well? Um, well, definitely, when you say standout workers, the first person I think of is Jody Flash. Um, he's a young guy, but he's one hell of a flyer. And uh, I think in the next couple of years, uh, he can definitely become uh, a major a major star. I think he's already a big star in, in England. And uh, I know he's going to try and come over to the States at some point uh maybe even to come over and, and try and wrestle in the Super 8 next year. And uh, I think that people are going to are gonna know his name. I mean, he's going he's gonna to be a star, definitely. Um, as far as the state of British wrestling, I, I, really, I really can't give an opinion on that. My, my experience with, with how British wrestling is going is a little uh, too shallow to give any informed opinions. But uh, it, what I, my understanding of it is right now that they're – they're just not doing as many shows as they need to. Um, I know the group that I went and worked for in October, it was only their second match or their second show. And, uh, you know, they had, they had started their promotion in, like, July. So, uh, you know, it's just a matter of uh, slowly building and, and building up an audience, I guess. Now, when uh, now you, you wrestled Jody Fleisch, didn't you, in that tournament over there? Yes. Yeah, how was how was how was that? Because I mean, I heard raves about your match with Otani and with Jody Fleisch. It was a lot of fun. It was it was. Uh, I've wrestled with Jody before in Mishinoku as well. He's been over there a couple of times, and uh, like I said, he, he's a good worker. He's real young right now, and uh, you know when he gets the experience to match his talent, he, he's going to be a player. Um, some of the stuff he does is just you know he defies gravity, and uh, you know he's, he's doing like shooting stars. Uh, in the ring, outside of the ring, to the floor, um, landing on his feet. You know, it's just, it, it's stuff that I, I don't, I haven't seen anybody in the States try and duplicate yet. And, um, you he, know, he I walks think, up walls. Yeah, yeah, he does the walk, he <laughs> walks the wall spot. Although it's kind of hard to fit into an arena. I don't know how the heck he's going to do that anywhere in the States, but, uh, yeah. We did a lot in Japan. Yeah, I just remember seeing those tapes just walking up the walls. <laughs> yeah, although it's kind of weird, too, because everybody knows when, when it's happening, because all of a sudden, you know, Jody and his opponents start walking towards the wall. So there's not much uh, question on what's going to happen next. <laughs> yeah. yeah, there's got to be a reason they're going there. Yeah, exactly. Hey, they're going to the wall. What's going to happen next? I don't know. You know? <laughs> Who do you think's your favorite guy to work with? Um, wow. You know, I, favorite guy to work with? Uh. Taka? I'd have to say Taka. I've had the most fun working with Taka. Um, he's a goof. <laughs> he's a goof. He's, he's, so, he's, he's such a funny guy outside of the ring, and he's such a great guy in the ring to work with. Um, you know, I've only really worked with him one-on-one -on -one a couple times, but uh, the times I was over in Japan, I got to work with him a lot in tag matches and, and six-mans, and uh, a lot of fun to be around and a lot of fun to work with. What about um, Mikey Henderson? What... How old, how old is he? Is he like 22-ish? Is that about right? Uh, think... Maybe a little younger than that. I think he just turned 21 this year. Okay. So was, yeah, so it was two years ago that I probably first saw you and him. Because the first time I think I saw you wrestle, I think it was in a tag match with him. Uh huh. And I think they told me he was 19 at the time. Yeah. Yeah, when we met, he was he was like 17 years old. So that was like 90. It was like 96. So, uh, you know, 21, 20, 21, something like that. Wow. He's got a. He's, I, I thought from the first time I saw him that he had a hell of a future. Yeah, and he still does. I mean, 
he, he still has a heck of a future in, in, in front of him. You know, it's just a matter now of, of catching that break and getting to the next level. Um, I don't think he's as prolific on the indies as he should be. Um, I think he should be working a lot of different places. And uh, for his own reasons, he's just been doing basically the Southern California stuff. But uh, he's definitely a guy I, I'm trying. I would like to see him go over to uh, work in the Super 8, uh, work on the East Coast. Um, you know, that that's up to him, though. That's his, that's his decision. I think if, if he were to start working out there, a lot more people would know who he is, and he would definitely have a future. And then, you know, catching that break is just a matter of time, I think. What did you think of him doing that that uh, tough man deal? Uh, I, I, uh, it was funny that that he actually went and did that. Um, I think as a tough man, he's a good wrestler. <laughs> Maybe what's the diplomatic way to say it? I they didn't really show a whole lot of him on television, but I, I knew that he he had a lot of heart and he stuck with it. It just uh, it wasn't his it wasn't his deal. But I mean, I you could say that about a lot of the, the wrestlers that were in there. And a lot of the football players too. It was kind of it was kind of grotesque to watch. It was a real messy show. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, you know what I felt really bad about was that all the wrestlers had to wear those pants that kept coming down, so it was almost like they were like they were Lita or something. All they needed was like a, a pair of, like a thong underwear to stick out. You know, poor uh, poor Aaron Aguilera had that thing almost down the crack of his ass. So you know, I, I felt really bad about the pants more than anything. I think was the pants. It was. I, I just remember watching that show, just going like, "Oh, this is like." <laughs> yeah, I, it's weird. I, you know, I, I'm glad I never would have done that because I don't. I don't. I know that my strong point is not, you know, trading punches with anybody. But uh, for, you know, that was. It took a lot. Of, it took a lot of heart for them to get on television and do this thing that, you know, they they probably knew that they weren't going to be very good at, and uh, for them to go out and have the heart to stick with it. You know, I, I got to give them that much. Yeah. Uh, you know, maybe a pair of shorts. <laughs> you know, something for next time. Yeah, let's go to Matt in Vancouver. Matt, what's going on? Hi, how are you guys doing today? Hello. Doing very good. Well, that's good. Um, is it true that Dota is trying to buy a headline sports? Um, not buy the whole company. They bought um, they bought one half of one percent of the stock today, and they have the option to buy up to ten percent of the stock by February of two thousand and two. And and they're going to put the XFL on that, right? Yeah, that's in can. Yeah, right. And, and, and uh, SmackDown and uh, Metal. Yeah, uh, why are they putting SmackDown on if some Canadians can already get it? Like, I guess en- I, I guess enough of them can't. <laughs> I, I, I didn't even know any Canadians could get it until I found out about a few minutes ago. Well, over here we get a uh, Tacoma, Washington. Oh, well, see, okay, that's different. See, that's like if uh, I, mean, I guess people get it on the border, but you know, you're getting it from on, from a border signal. I mean, you get Tacoma all the way in Vancouver. Yeah. Wow. UPN eleven. That's probably, on, on the cable. that's probably on the cable. That's probably not. It's on the cable. It's not like you get it over the air, right? No, it, it's on the cable. Yeah, see, so that's that's believable. But yeah, it's, it's still um, WrestleMania uh, 17. Are they going to break that barrier over 66,000, or are they going for 66,000? Well, whatever they're going to get it. I mean, they got 50,000 already. It's five months away or four and a half months away. Um, I mean, the building's 66,000, so that's what they're going to end up with. Um, so whatever, what, um, whatever they're going to get with whatever the place holds. It's not like uh, they can't they can't get like eighty thousand. It's even even if they say they did, <laughs> which they won't this year. But they, you know that's what they're going to get. Um, was, do you know if the Rock uh, Princeton Wall match from uh, SmackDown was a good match? I mean, I I, I, I know one. To. Yeah, nobody in a report said anything one way or the other. But unless it was like one minute, you know, I, I'm I would think it would be. I mean, you know, if you watch. Those guys always have a good match. I don't think they, they've disappointed yet, those two, as um, far as what, single. What was that thing that uh, Triple H had a back injury? Uh, do you know what it was called or what? how long he would, how long he's going to be out for? He's wrestling Sunday. It's pretty bad. I mean, I'm sure, like, under normal circumstances, he wouldn't be wrestling Sunday. But uh, he's got, like, a lot of problems. Is, um, he, he's he got, uh, you know, the inflamed, um, what's it called, sciatic nerve. Uh, which is giving him uh, muscle spasms. He's tore uh, muscle in his that went to that went to his hip, uh, bruised his hip bone. Um, things you know has ligament sprains. I mean, his, his back is a mess. Um, Chris. Yes. Um, what, what were the wrestlers that you looked up to when uh, you were younger and that you try to uh, follow in your career right now? Um, when I 
my first favorite wrestler was Magnum TA. I grew up watching him, and I got to see him wrestle uh, Flair and, and the Kid Cole off live, and that was a big deal. And um, I'd have to say uh, the other guy was Ricky Steamboat. I, I really liked watching him work, and uh, I thought he had a hell of a career everywhere he went, and he was definitely somebody that I looked up to. Um, as far as as far as career though, the, the person I kind of looked up to in terms of my wrestling was Shawn Michaels. He was always the guy that I tried to emulate. Another one. There you yeah. go. Get on the list. Shock. Um, Every no, it's, it's 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 like our inside joke because, like, every wrestler that's young um, that comes on the show, that's always the name they bring up. Yeah. Is Shawn Michaels. Well, you know, um, I think a lot of it had to do with I think a lot of it had to do with the fact that he was a smaller guy coming up. He was like one of the first smaller guys coming up in a big man's company or in a big man's, you know, job. And uh, the fact that he ended up becoming world champion says a lot against the big man stereotype in professional wrestling. And I, if there's one thing that I was always against in in wrestling, it was always the fact that if you weren't big, you weren't good. And uh, you know, I, I still fight it now. I mean, I, I'm I'm trying to put on weight, but I'm I'm still. It's one of those things where. Even in this day and age, people have the the tendency to look at me and go, "Hey, you're a wrestler," and that drives me crazy. I think I think there's so many good like cruiserweight, light heavyweight guys that aren't even like 230 that that are so good as wrestlers, and and you know it's still hard mm-hmm. even in this day and age for people to break that that uh, that stereotype in their mind that big okay, man like, equals wrestler. You know, Mysterio and Hoobintoot. Yeah, yeah, definitely. You know, I mean, you know, Mysterio's absolutely tiny. Yeah. But Chris, have you? Have you I mean, Ray now is is so jacked, though. Yeah. I, I mean, he's small, but he's so muscular. But I mean, I was I was on a show, I was on a UPW show with Hoovy, like uh, last week, and uh, you know, physically, I'm bigger than Hoovy, you know. And I, oh, I kind of yeah. look at myself like if if you're smaller than me, uh, you're I'm like the low end of of size as far as wrestling in my eyes. If you're smaller than me, then you better really have something to show. Other than size, to to get yourself somewhere, and uh, you know who he's got it. So, Chris, have you been, have you ever met uh, Ricky Steamboat or Shawn Michaels? No, I haven't. Oh, um, do you guys know what the the heat main event for is uh, this Sunday? Uh, Steve, Steve Blackman boss against uh, Black. Boss Man. It is. Okay, thanks for the time, guys. Bye. You know, you mentioned uh, uh, Steamboat. I had a kind of question. Um, when you were a kid watching Steamboat, I mean, did you like Steamboat because of his character, or did you like, or did you recognize that Steamboat was just such an awesome worker in the ring? Um, you know what? I, I like the fact that he never turned heel in his career. I, I, I always like. I never got the impression of him. Like there were some people who were baby faces that got on my nerves. And, and like when I talk about being a baby face, I always say like uh, Tom Zank. Like I, I like Tom Zank as a worker, but as a baby face, he kind of drove me crazy because he was like that. His baby face persona was like that, hey, everybody, get behind me, that type of thing. And, rah, 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 yeah, rah, exactly. Rah, and Ricky yeah. Steamboat, even though he was sort of like that, he never he never rubbed me the wrong way. He was always the type of guy that I rooted for as the baby face. You know, even in, in the day where people get behind the heel, um, he was he was a guy that I looked at and I never was like, boo, boo the baby face. He, he was, you know, and it, it was probably because he was such a great worker. But at the same time, it seemed like his character retained that integrity of being the good guy, you know. Despite, you know, whenever he was in a slump, whenever he was losing matches, you know, you still rooted for him. So I, I, a little bit of both, I think. The fact that he was such a good worker, but his character was, he, he kept his character uh, solid throughout, you know. There was a TV show that you were on. In fact, someone just sent an email about this. Um, and for the life of me... It was the show with, what was the show? It was a late night show and, and you were on with Bret Hart taking bumps from some woman's clothes. It was ever. It was later. Later. Well, see, later. Right. right. Okay. I ah, good see, time. Let me, let me just check the, uh, let's see. Was it Rita Sever? Yeah. That's her. <laughs> I remember that. Yeah. Because I saw a show a long time ago on NBC. It was a late night show. I can't remember the name, but it had a female host, and they interviewed Bret Hart. He did demonstrations from wrestling moves, and Chris Daniels was the guy he demonstrated on. At least it looked a lot like him. No, it was, I remember it was him, yeah. Could you ask him, um, how did you get to do that thing for Bret? Did you know Bret, or was it just a local casting call thing? I mean, how, how did you end up getting there? It was pretty much goes, a, local, yeah, I, it was a local casting call, and it was kind of a last-minute thing. 
because I had a I had a job. I was working for um, Walt Disney at the time, and uh, they gave me a call at like one o'clock, and they said we need you here by three thirty. So I I went home and got my stuff and and went out there and got a chance to meet Brett. That was the first time I'd ever met him, and uh, I only really got a chance to talk to him for like five minutes before we went out and did the stuff that we did. But uh, that was uh, that was an interesting day. It was an interesting day. And, wow, uh, like what? a last-minute deal. It, it like was a fun. Deal. It was yeah. fun. Uh, let's see. Uh, this is from John, who's talking about. It says very few people in Canada get UPN. Some of us in Toronto can get it from the UPN Boston, but it's part of an expensive premium cable package. Uh, this is someone who says that they have no pairs tickets left for WrestleMania. All that's left is single seats. So that means they must be awful close to sold out. I'll try to get an update on the number uh, tomorrow. And this is a question for Chris. Uh, what's your opinion of cr- the members of Crazy Max? Um, I think uh, Crazy Max is is uh, a good group. My, you know, I think Shima Nobunaga has the the most potential of of really being the super superstar. But uh, right now, that gimmick and that that crew, they all fit, uh, and they're they're ridiculously over everywhere that I've I've been wrestling with them. It just ridiculously over, and uh, I think they've got a good, uh, they've got a long career out of them. Someone from WCW was talking to me yes yesterday, Tuesday, yeah, and they were talking about turning the company around, um, and it was kind of like that first hour emphasized work, and I was saying like you know like like the old basically it was trying to redo what they did in '96 and '97 when they really made Nitro hot, and one of the things that made Nitro hot was you know, all those, you know, the Ultimo Dragons and Benoit and, you know, introducing Rey Mysterio Jr., so the whole psychosis, the whole crew of the great workers match after match, and then you had the big stars in the main event. That was kind of the Eric Bischoff formula. I'm not trying to credit it to him or say that, you know, he's great. For, it's not a brilliant formula. It just it was the formula, and it did work at the time. Um, and then I said, like, the difference between now and 96 is, is that there's not a whole bunch of guys in Mexico um, that, you know, are undiscovered that can come in and have impact, and then which may or may not be right, but that's what I said. And they said, what about all of Dragon's guys, which is, you know, Shima Nobunaga, and those guys. What's your thoughts as far as, I mean, it's, again, there's, there, there is the language barrier, which is something that, you know, is always given the knock on guys that are from a foreign country. Um, yet, you know, there's, some of those guys are really superior workers like, like Shima Nobunaga. What's, what's your thoughts as far as, or Magnum Tokyo or some of those type of guys? Um, I think that that's, pretty much dead on the fact that they there's a language barrier is going to be the thing that keeps them from from really crossing over here i mean uh, unless one of two things happen unless they come over here and learn enough english to get by or unless they're they're saddled with someone who gets to be a mouthpiece for them um you know there's there's ways to work around it i mean you've got these these writers uh that uh you know, is there no way that they can get a guy that they're, that's not going to speak on a microphone? Is there no way that they can put him and, and feature him in a show? I mean, it's just a matter of do they want to do that? Do they want to put that effort into getting a guy who is not going to speak uh, if they're going to give him ring time? I mean, I think that's one of the things, too, that, that uh, you know, I mean, Sabu has never cut a promo as far as I'm aware of. And, uh, you know, that's one of the things that they that people say about him, like, oh, well, if Sabu would speak, then he would be more over or he would have a job in, in WWF or WCW. And, and see, that's kind of ridiculous. Um, Actually, so, I, think he, I, I think that he's better off not speaking. Yeah, yeah, you know, and there's, there's no reason why that type of thing should hold a worker back. But in this day and age, uh, especially, you know, the emphasis that's put on television, uh, I think that's going to be the one thing that would hold someone like that back. And um, it's too bad, too, because when the bell rings, you're not cutting a promo. And some of those guys, I mean, they can't speak English, but they have so much charisma. Right. And, you know, yeah. if they could just, I mean, look at guys like La Parca. I mean, they it's became just cult heroes, just, and they never said anything. They just danced around and did whatever. And, I mean, there's guys in WCW right now that can speak English, but they still can't cut a promo, and they have no charisma in the ring. You know, the, 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 the other thing as far as, like, you know, every rule in wrestling, you know, that, that we'll hear, we, there's always an exception. And I mean, like, when you're talking about, like, well, you know, they can't get over because they can't cut a promo. And I start, you know, the first things pop in my head are Kane and Bill Goldberg. And granted, those are both real big guys. But, I mean, like, as, as a kid watching wrestling, 
there were plenty of guys who weren't big guys. In fact, some small guys uh, that got over huge that never did a promo, but, but usually it was because they had a good manager by them who did the promo. I mean, Bobby Heenan could have gotten over. Any, if, you, if there was a good worker, any good worker anywhere, he could have been a masked, a masked man who never spoke, um, but if he was good enough in the ring and you had Bobby Heenan out of the ring or Jim Cornette out of the ring, you know, they'd get him over. Yeah. It's just it's just now do they want to take that time and effort. You know, it seems like they're looking for the quick, you know, the the uh, the quick fix, the quick uh, the quick get over. You know, and, and do they want to put the time and effort into getting somebody who's not going to speak English? Are they going to put him with a manager? Or are they going to put him in situations where he doesn't have to speak? And, uh, you know, maybe they think it's just easier to find somebody that can speak English and teach them to work rather than have a guy who can work you know, circles uh, come in and 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 figure out a way to get him over without having to talk. So it, it's I, kind of a it's kind of a, a backwards uh, it's kind of a backwards thing, but it's the way it is right now. Have you ever seen tape of Urban Wrestling? Say that again. Have you ever seen a tape of Urban Wrestling? I Urban saw wrestling? I saw their first show. Yeah, I saw, well, I don't know if it was their first show. I saw a show of them. Yeah, because I was actually just before we went on the air, I actually saw that for the first time, and I thought it was like interesting in that. It was clear to me that they took a bunch of guys with no regard to whether or not they could work, but as far as, like, we could make characters out of them. And then when I was watching it, and it was like, once the bell rang, I mean, I just couldn't get into it because, you know, again, they, they couldn't work. Yeah. The, the show I saw, they had um, Tony Jones wrestling uh, Vinny Valentino and uh, a couple other guys. And my opinion of it was it, it seemed like they had, it seemed like every other place, they had guys that could do some good stuff and guys that couldn't do as much. But uh, I think the thing that lost me was that they it seemed like they were trying to be more like an American Gladiators type show rather than a wrestling show. They were having yeah. all these one these one word names and uh not stereotypical but real one dimensional characters. I mean the the show I saw had Aaron Baker on it. And if there's someone who's got name value in that company outside of wrestling it would be Aaron Baker, you know, I mean former Invaluable. pro bodybuilder and, you know, uh someone who competed for Miss Universe titles, but they didn't want to call him Aaron Baker, they just called him Aaron. And to me that was like, well that's, that's kind of ridiculous <laughs> to take a guy who's got name value and throw it away. Yeah, Better than really. Baker. Yeah, 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 exactly. Or Baker or A Baker or A B or something like <laughs> at that. At least they didn't at least they didn't make him like, you know, like a, with a chef hat. But, yeah, um, yeah. You know the other the other thing on that on that show was there were just way too many women. Yeah, you know what? Uh, it was like three girls for every guy. Yeah, it was like a million women, and it was just like, I mean, how, how are any, how, like how do you remember any, yeah. Well, let's go to Dave in New York. Dave, what's going on? Hey, guys, got a quick question for Dave before I ask Chris my question. Actually, two questions for Dave before I get to Chris. Um, uh, a friend of mine sent you a tape recently. I was wondering if you got a look at it. You had a tape of survival to beat the matches from Japan. I got it. I haven't. I haven't seen it yet. I'm like really behind on tapes. I just watched Urban Wrestling this morning, so no. <laughs> but no, I haven't seen it yet. But I do. Ha I do have it right in front of me. Okay. He, uh, he, he do, you do know what it is, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I do. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So you'll finally get to see Ken the Box. Yeah. Okay. Uh, nothing. Just as far as Lucha tours that they could bring into the U.S., I just watched an IWRG tape, mm -hmm. and they've got a couple good guys like Moto Cross and Alan Stone. Yeah, I've heard that those and, guys are really uh, good. Dr. I, I've seen Dr. Cerebro on Japanese tapes before. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Chris. Yes. I was wondering, uh, when you did the Worldwide Magic against Alan Funk about a month or two back, Yeah. Uh, did you hurt yourself on that, on that uh, bump he took <laughs> on the floor? I actually didn't. Um, it was funny because... That was really scary. Yeah. I, it, not, it wasn't funny, but after the match, I came back and everybody yelled at me. They were like, what the hell did you just do? What's the matter with you? Why did you do that? And I, I, I honestly didn't know what the big deal was until a month later I saw it on television, and then I realized that it looked like I drove my neck into my sternum. <laughs> but um, yeah, I, I was fine actually, and um, it was it was actually a joke. The next time I saw Alan Funk, I had actually hurt my neck working out, and uh, he thought it was funny that I could dive from the top rope to the floor and not hurt myself, but uh, doing side lateral raises, I twist my neck so. That is sort of amusing in a, in a sad way. Yeah, <laughs> I'm uh, I'm extremely durable in some instances and extremely fragile in others. So, 
It's wow. Weird. I, I don't know how anyone could be a, a wrestler that, that could be fragile, and then, like, especially your style, you know, it's like, you know, because you're, you're bouncing up. I mean, I from from the matches I've seen you, I mean, you're bouncing up from, from everything. Yeah. Well, I've, I've been really lucky. I've only been injured seriously once, and uh, everything else has just been kind of passing, you know, bumps and, bumps and bruises. So what was I've that? Been, extremely lucky with some of the stuff I've done. And, uh, yeah, I don't understand how guys can, can be wrestlers and be fragile. I mean, I know a lot of guys that spend a lot of their career being injured, and it seems to me like, how how can you stay with it? How can you stick with it? But What was, what the, was your uh, serious injury? injury? What was your serious injury? Um, this last, this February, I pulled my groin in Japan, and I ended up having a, it was the first time I ever had to cancel a show because I was hurt. And uh, it was so bad that I, I couldn't even walk. So, but it, the the thing about it was, or the good thing about it was, it only kept me kind of messed up for like three weeks. So I, again, I was really lucky. It could have it could have laid me up for a really long time. And it it just so happened that it got well, it got better like in the middle of my last Japanese tour. So, were you working injured when you did the Super Eight, eight or was it recovered by then? No, I was working injured. It's uh, I was I thought I was recovered. And as I was in the locker room and I was stretching out, I pulled it again. So I ended up wrestling three matches, kind of hurt. Um, if you watch the tape, the match that I had with Ace Darling, he gives me the bulldog. I can hardly stand up because I, I pulled it, like, extra hard, taking the face bump. And as I'm getting up to take another move, I'm, I'm kind of staggering pretty badly because I, I couldn't stand up straight. Wow, because you went to just awesome matches at that show. Thank That's you. a compliment. Yeah. Thank you very much. Especially uh, the match with Vic Capri, because that was just, it was just unlike anything you'll ever see on an indie tape, and, and like any other indie tape, because like, you just get the hell out of each other in that match. Yeah, um, I was lucky, Vic is, a, Vic is a really good worker, and he's got a good uh, sensibility as far as the Japanese style, which I think in the past like two years I've kind of developed into. Uh, without even really knowing it. And so to to tell him what I wanted to kind of do in the match, and he kind of followed me with it. And uh, the thing about it, too, being that we, we kind of knew we were going to put everything in there and, and shake hands afterwards, so it was no no big deal to get in there and take a couple of hard shots. Um, someone sent me an email of a picture that they took when he gave me the, uh, the half Nelson, Nelson suplex, suplex, and it's uh, a picture of me, like, right on the top of my head with my legs sticking straight up in the air. Oh, my God. Yeah, that was a nice picture, though. <laughs> laughed and laughed. One last question. Uh, at the Super 8, did the guys in the masks that had the signs about you tasting great scare you? <laughs> I was just shocked that anybody in the States even follows uh, Mission Curry Man. I just The fact that he's over as much as he is, it's so odd. I couldn't understand it in Japan, and to even try and understand it here in the States is weird. I actually had a guy make the official Curry Man website, like, six months after I stopped doing the character. And it's up now. Oh, yeah, spicyone.com, yeah. right? Yeah, I'm just, it's astounding that people uh, got into it like they did. But uh, my my friend Kevin Quinn explained to me, he said that he thought it was so over because it was so different. And the fact that it was an American guy doing a, uh, a Mexican-style comedy gimmick in Japan, it just... It's like it's like the stars converting. You'll never see anything like that again. So I, I was real lucky to have that happen and the way it got over. And yeah, it was kind of scary. I wasn't expecting it when I walked out of the crowd and all of a sudden I look over and there's you know octagon and and all the different masks that they were wearing <laughs> holding up signs. It's kind of weird. Actually, I bought a Curry Man mask from someone a couple months ago. You did? Yeah. You owe me five dollars. There's got to be some sort of payment <laughs> for me because I don't. Like, you should get someone that. to make them. You can buy. I mean. Because you sell you sell the Curry Man shirts at shows, right? Yeah, but I I made those. I mean, I <laughs> I made those and, and set them up, so it's not anything. But I I never made the mask. I don't know who I would even go to to make the mask. I got it from a guy that uh, knows one of the mask makers in Mexico. Really? Yeah. I, I, I got it pretty cheap. I got it for like twenty four bucks. Into my profits. The ma the masks. <laughs> no, um, you you know that in um I think it was Weekly Pro at the end of I think it was the end of last year. When they did like their most popular foreign wrestler, like you were like, I mean, you were, I know you were in the top five. I think you were like number four or something. Really? No, I didn't know that. I didn't know that. Yeah, they, they was like with you know, it's, it's, yeah, it's like Stan Hansen, Scott Norton, you know, probably Vader and you. It's like wow. their most popular foreign wrestler. Why the hell would anyone choose Scott Norton over Chris? 
<laughs> well, he's just been, it's just like one of those things. I think Scott Norton may have been first, which is like really scary in another way. Yeah, well, I think it's just the, the, the form that they had being in New Japan and All Japan, a lot more people know who they are, so. Well, Scott Norton, he's just been there forever and, and he's still there. Yeah. How, I'm not, how, now, how come, um, is there any reason why you're not going back there? You just don't want to, or? Um, or? No, I, I, I have no problem going back there. Um, I just haven't, I, I actually sent them an email in the last couple of weeks letting them know that I was available to do it again. It's just now a matter of if they want me to come back. Um, mm -hmm. I'm, you know, I, I left, when I left in March, I left on really good terms, so I, I don't think there'd be a problem with me going back. It just hasn't materialized yet, so I'm sure I'm going to be wearing the ugly yellows once again. Remember to get Sasuke to pay you in cash, though. Oh, yeah. Oh, that's never been a problem. He always pays me in cash. So. Okay. Now, that's when, good when to you, know. I mean, do you, do you, when you go over there, I mean, um, I mean cause a, lot, a lot of people, when they go to Japan for a lengthy tour, you know, it kind of drives them crazy. Because, you know, you're in Japan and everything's so different. After about two weeks, you start, you know, or, or for you, is it just fun? Uh, it, it's, a, it's about two weeks before I start to get really irritated. Um. I, I found out the first tour I went on that you have to bring your own stimuli. Uh, you mm. got to bring your, you know, there's nothing American for you there. You got to bring your own music, your own books. Uh, the last time I went over there, I had a laptop and it, it played DVDs, so I brought a bunch of movies to watch. And it takes about two weeks for me to read everything I bring and listen to everything I bring and watch everything I bring, and then you start getting kind of antsy to go home. Um, the the Mass Man tour was six weeks long, so that was Ooh. like the longest two months of my life, or it felt like that. And uh, three weeks was about the longest that I would go without actually, like, getting really irritable and really not fun to be around by the end. Yeah, because I, I just know from, from my own going there, I, I think the longest I ever went was two weeks, maybe a little more than two weeks. Mm. And it was like, every time I've gone, like, for a week, it's like, no problem. You know, it's just like, it's a fun vacation. But I just remember the one time I went for, I think it was two and a half weeks, at about the two-week mark, it was just like, I want, to, I want to go home. And it was nothing. I was having a great time every day there, but it was just like, it's just like time to come home. You know yeah. what I mean? Well, it was always the downtime for me. I mean, the wrestling was fun, getting there, uh, getting set up, wrestling the matches, finishing up. That was always great. But it was like the time between, like the travel time and the sitting in your hotel. And I'm not much of a sightseer, so it wasn't like I was going out taking pictures of Mount Fuji or anything. I was just kind of sitting there and, you know, thinking, <laughs> thinking of myself. Now, now how's, how's the travel? Because you, you, did you ever go there, like, during one of those winter tours where it was, or, or was it, um, I mean, was, tra was travel hard in, on that tour? Um, not too hard. I mean, the last, it, when I was there in March, there was, like, snow up to the roofs of, like, single-story buildings. But um, the travel wasn't too bad. I mean, we always rode the bus. It was never anything like we were trucking around in cars or anything. Um, you know, every once in a while there was a, a like an all day drive, but uh, nothing I couldn't handle. You know, it was it was boring. It was just a bus ride. Mm. Just listen to my CDs or do something. Anything else, Dave? I uh, just want to tell tell Chris that I'll I'll email him uh, about the guy that I got the Korean man mask from. Okay. And also, you have a lot of marks for you at DeathValleyDriver.com. I know oh. Brian goes there a lot. Okay. Uh, okay, so just curry man Thanks. <laughs> okay. Ken the box forever. <laughs> I'll bet that guy was the one who got all the signs to that one show. Probably. <laughs> Probably. That, that gimmick, I mean, just with the hat and everything. Uh... <laughs> it's odd. I tried, every time I went back, I tried to add Thanks something goofy to it. So uh, every every time there was like the, the draws hat or the t-shirt or... Uh, Writing "Eat Me" on my arm in Japanese. Just, I just tried to find <laughs> stupid stuff to do. You know, <laughs> if you watch the tape of the J Cup where I come out, at, at that point I knew it was like my last hurrah. So it was like go out and shake my ass like an idiot for. Oh, I saw that whole minutes. thing. Yeah. Oh, that was that was that was, that was a hell of a match, though. Thank I you. thought I was blown up. But I'm, I'm glad he took so long to get to the ring because going around dancing for five minutes, I was. <gasps> <laughs> As you call on my name, like, oh God, please don't run, don't rush the ring. Because I had never, se I'd never seen him, and I thought that, like, you know, the, especially the beginning of the match, it was like, because I think a lot of people had never seen him, and it was kind of like, whoa, you know, he, it, it, it's kind of, it's not like what you expect when you see some guy in this gimmick costume, and all of a sudden he's throwing these awesome drop kicks. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. 
uh, yeah, I wasn't quite sure what, what to expect from me either, but uh, but it ended up really well, and it, I was really happy with it and proud of it. So, Chris, we got to wrap it up right now. I want to thank you very much for doing the show, and uh, good luck in uh, in getting. I mean, they know they know who you are, and just like someone coming up with an idea for you because you yeah. deserve it. Yeah, thank you very much, Dave, Brian. Thank you very much for having me, and uh, hopefully I can come back on again.